It's great to be back for the uh, weekly online recorded lectionary-based Bible studies. I um, want to thank everybody who said that uh, they were looking forward to these studies resuming. Also want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to have this uh, uh, three-month break. Uh, first of all, we actually did get out of Maricopa County not just once but twice. And the second time to cooler temperatures. Also, uh, we had a chance to prepare uh, four series of studies that we're looking forward to being able to present in person. And also, I uh, audited a course on the Israelite United Kingdom uh, through Jerusalem University College. And this fall, we'll be auditing a course through the same school on Biblical Jerusalem. <clears throat> so it's been a great time, <clears throat> but it's great to be back now for the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, first of all, let's look at the first reading. <clears throat> Excuse me. Want to take a look at a couple maps to set um, uh, the setting. Uh, the first reading from Isaiah 35 comes from the time of the prophet Isaiah, obviously, and uh, King Hezekiah in the mid uh, 700s BC. And at that particular time, uh, for about 180 years now, Israel, the kingdom had been divided into two kingdoms. We have the kingdom of Israel, 10 tribes up in the north, and then two tribes down here in the south. Um, and uh, Hezekiah was the king in the south, and uh, also Isaiah had his ministry to the uh, king and the people in the south. Now, let's look at the next map. At the time of Isaiah 35, the big threat was the kingdom, was the Assyrian Empire. And you can first uh, see the Assyrian Empire in 824 BC, which is about 75 years prior to the first reading. Um, the capital was in Nineveh, that's where Jonah went to. You can see where the Assyrian Empire was. And then in the lighter green, you can see where the Assyrian Empire was in 671 BC, which is about 80 years after our second reading. You can see at this particular time, the northern kingdom has been conquered by Assyria and is absorbed uh, into Assyria. They conquered them and deported the people, but you can see how the southern kingdom still exists. It, did, it just kind of was able to hold on and hang in there. And I think this map also shows why um, the empires of the day would be so interested in conquering the land of Israel and Judah. It's a, the location is just incredibly strategic. It's kind of like real estate agents would say, the primary issues are location, location, location. Well, Israel and Judah are located right between the Egyptian um, land of Egypt and the Nile River. And then also you have Mesopotamia, the land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. So you can see, you can just see how strategically important that is and why that would be conquered by um, all these empires. And really to understand the uh, Old Testament, you would need to understand the geography of the setting. But it's just really interesting how what's the one place that is able to hold out and not be conquered by the Assyrians? And you see that is Judah. And it's later conquered by the Babylonians about 90 years later. Well, that is the setting. And then I write in the, in the study guide, that at this time, the greatest threat were the Assyrians, and they were cruel and vicious, mean conquerors. They were not going to destroy the southern kingdom, as we saw on the map, but they were going to be able to defeat and deport the northern kingdom, not too many years after the time of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was around 750 BC. The destruction of the north was around 722 BC. I also listed a couple um, um, things from chapters just before our first reading. So you kind of get the setting, the, the tone, the, the atmosphere of the day. In Isaiah 36, an Assyrian official says to the, the people of Jerusalem, don't let Hezekiah mislead you by saying the Lord will save us. Has any other God of any other nation saved them? Obvious answer that he wants to give is no. So don't think that you're going to get saved either. And yet they did hold out. Now Hezekiah, uh, in 30, chapter 37, Hezekiah gets a threatening letter. He receives a threatening letter from the hand of the messengers from the Assyrian Empire 
and he reads it. This was probably the worst letter he ever received in his entire life. And it's powerful, powerful for us what he did. He took the letter. What are you going to do with it? He doesn't tear it up. Instead, he goes to the temple. He goes to the house of the Lord and he spreads it out before the Lord. Powerful example for us. And so I ask the question, when have you faced a situation that was so dire, so bad, so beyond your ability to handle that the only thing that you were able to do was to just take it to God and spread it out before God? And isn't it great to know that we have a God to whom we can go when life is simply beyond our ability to cope with and just spread it out before him and say, God, this is way beyond me. I need to turn it over to you. Powerful example for us. But let's look at the reading, the verses of our first reading, Isaiah 35. And this is another example of how I believe that we who live in the desert can understand so many of the scriptural images. Because we see um, during the winter rains, and if we have uh, some months of good monsoon season, the summer rains, we can see what abundant rain does to the desert. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, last Sunday, we had a storm coming in, and we were hoping for some rain. And we got the wind and the dark clouds and the lightning and thunder, but no rain. But going outside, it's like I could see how it was raining every, all the way around us, but it did not rain where we live. I guess in, in Arizona, you got to be happy if anybody gets any rain anyplace. But think of what rain does to the desert. Think of that image that we can relate to and understand. The wilderness, verse 1, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. You know, as we have these, in, like in the spring, these wonderful wildflower displays. And you think, wow, this is a desert? Verse 3, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. That's something I can relate to as feeble knees. Say to those who are of fearful heart, be strong. Here's your God. He'll come with vengeance. He'll come to save you. And this was a situation where Israel, Judah very much needs saving. And we can see from that map that God did. It's, isn't that amazing the way in which they were able to stay as their own country when everybody around them fell to the Assyrians. I think that's a powerful map that we looked at. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. You can see in that phrase why this is the first reading that relates to our gospel reading that we'll be getting to. The lame shall leap like a deer, the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. That also you can see, we'll see how it relates to the gospel reading and why it was chosen for this Sunday. A uh, water shall break forth in the wilderness, streams of the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. And so I ask the question, how is the effect of abundant rain upon the desert a symbol of hope and new life for you? And so when it rains here in the desert and this coming winter during the hopefully good rainy season and things turn green and all the plants get washed off and the swallows fill out and are happy and the wildflowers blossom, say, this is a reminder to me of the hope and new life that we can find in God. Now, for several weeks now, our second reading is from the book of James. James is probably most well known because of the phrase that faith without works is dead. A faith that doesn't do something is a dead faith. So, verse 1, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our Lord Jesus Christ? I ask the question, is there any way in which you show favoritism? If so, what do you need to change? And then James, James says, well, what if, and, and he is the brother of Jesus who became a believer after the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus appeared to him and he became a leader in the church in Jerusalem. Well, let's say that you have someone that comes in that dresses, that's obviously wealthy, that the gold rings and designer clothes and fine clothes, and you can tell they have money. How do you treat them? And what if a poor person comes in? And how do you treat them? 
Do you show favoritism towards the wealthy? Verses 5 to 7. Has not God chosen the poor to be rich in faith? It's powerful the way in which today it's, um, you know, Christianity is really growing the most powerfully in third world countries, in the southern hemisphere, the third world. And it's often in the areas of greatest poverty where, where you know, they are strongest in their faith. So often those who have the least are those who rely upon God the most. But you've dishonored the poor. Now, you honor the rich. And yet, what do the rich do? They oppress you. They drag you into court. You know, why do you show favoritism? Verse 10, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. Yeah, that's the problem with the law is all I have to do is to break the law once and I'm guilty in the eyes of the law. It's like, um, let's see, where was I driving? Oh, I was driving on Joe Max from 118th down to, uh, to, to Alma School and there was that sign that I'm glad that they give the signs to tell alerting to you to when there's going to be one of those vehicles or a station that checks for speeding. And so I slow down. It's amazing how having one of those signs and one of those little vehicles makes us slow down. But you know, if I was speeding and I got a ticket and I were to plead, but officer, I only did it once. Think of all the times that I didn't speed. You should let me off because 99.9% .9 of the time I don't speed. Well, all I need to do it one, is once in order to be guilty. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. And so that's why, you know, salvation by our keeping the law won't work because we cannot do it perfectly all the time, haven't already done so, and simply cannot do that in the future because in the eyes of the law, we're guilty. What good is it if you have, say you have faith but don't do good works, if you see people who are hungry and, and, and uh, lack food and lack clothing and, and you say nice things, but you don't do anything about it. Faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Good works show that faith is alive. And so how do you show your faith through the good things that you do? Our good works. We are not saved by our works, but our faith leads us to do Good works gives us the motivation and gives us the power and the desire to do good things. Now, in our gospel reading, Jesus is going to be helping two people. Let's first of all set the setting for the first one. Um, this is here, um, uh, the Sea of Galilee, the town of Capernaum, which was the hometown of Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and the center of Jesus' ministry. And um, Jesus is now going to go up to the um, area of the Phoenicians, to Tyre and Sidon. And so he's going to move out of Gentile territory, out of Jewish territory, which he does not do very often. But he goes up into um, Phoenician territory up here. And so that, that explains why he had the encounter with the Syrophoenician woman. So Jesus went to the region of Tyre. A woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him and came and bowed down at his feet. She was a foreigner, a Gentile, Syrophoenician. She's also not a gospel called a Canaanite woman. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said, well, you know, you don't give the food to the ch dogs before you give the food to the children. And the woman said, but even the little dogs under the table can eat the crumbs that if they fall from the table. Um, it's like uh, if we're having, Terry and I are having dinner and Sophie's outside and then she comes in and she zoom, immediately comes to under the table to see if there are any crumbs. And the problem is that she comes to my side of the table and I tell her, Sophie, you need to go over to Terry's side of the table because there's more have to be crumbs there. But she always goes to my side of the table first for some reason. Well, she doesn't just eat crumbs under the table. We actually feed her as well and give her treats, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And Jesus says, the, you may go, the demon has left your daughter, and she goes home and finds the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. 
Now, people have asked the question, why in the world would Jesus treat this woman in this way? Why would he seem to be so cold, uncaring, and indifferent to her? And I have, for example, um, Matthew, when Matthew tells this story, he gives some additional very interesting details. Uh, first of all, in Matthew 15, he said he did not answer her at all. At first, first, when she, uh, the woman comes to Jesus, he doesn't even answer her. He doesn't respond to her. Why not? That seems terrible, you know, and uh, that, that he would handle it that way. And then later he does answer by, you don't give the food to the dogs when it should go to the children. And so at first he doesn't answer her at all. But why would he handle it in this way? And there are three explanations that have been given, which I have listed on the study guide. One suggestion is that Jesus, during the process of the conversation, changed his mind and became more inclusive in his thinking. Um, I, I don't like that. I don't like that explanation. That just isn't the Jesus that I know. I think of John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus came to save the whole world. God's love is for the whole world. I don't think it's that Jesus changed his mind and became more inclusive in his thinking. Another possible explanation I list is that Jesus wanted to show the disciples how bad their attitude was. And so first, Jesus responds in a way that, this is, that corresponds to how the disciples would respond because he wanted to show the disciples how bad their response was. For example, in Matthew, which adds a little detail, the disciples urged Jesus, send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. Talk about the disciples' exalted view of themselves. She's shouting after us. Well, she's not shouting after the disciples. She's shouting after Jesus. But he wants to show the disciples how bad their attitude was. The explanation I like is that Jesus wanted to give the woman a chance to strengthen her faith through exercising it. He knew that she was going to be going back to a hostile situation, to a tough, hostile environment, and he wanted to help prepare her for it. You know, how do you strengthen a muscle? By exercising it. How do you increase in physical endurance? By, through exercise. And so Jesus knew that this woman was going into a tough situation and he wanted to give her a chance to strengthen her faith. Um, it's really a, question, a good question for all of us. You know, can you think of a time where, where Jesus allowed you to experience or go through a tough situation? And you might have thought, Jesus, why did you do that for me? And then after you realized that, Jesus, you wanted me to grow in my faith, to strengthen my faith. That was tough, but it was a faith-strengthening, life-preparing experience. And did Jesus, knowing that it was going to be tough for her, going back to her setting as someone who experienced the goodness of God, he wanted to help her prepare for it. <clears throat> now, it's interesting. I, I mentioned that when Matthew tells this story, he includes some things that are not in Mark that I think are very significant. First of all, I've already mentioned a couple. Matthew mentions that at first, Jesus did not respond to her at all. Second, G Matthew quotes the disciples, send her away, she keeps shouting after us, which is an overexalted view of the disciples of themselves. But also in Matthew's account, Jesus, uh, the woman calls Jesus son of David once, and the woman calls Jesus Lord three times. And I think that's significant, and it makes sense. First of all, this woman, though being up north, a Syrophoenician woman, though not being in the land of Israel, she had heard enough about Jesus, and she knew enough about the Jewish faith that she would refer to Jesus as son of David and as Lord. And, um, and, and I, now, why would Matthew include that? Remember that Mark was probably written to a, a, a Roman audience. Matthew was written to a Jewish audience. And I think Matthew is saying something to the Jewish people, that here is this woman, a foreigner, someone from outside the land of Israel, that we might, like the disciples, cast aside and say, send her away. 
But you know, she's heard about our faith and she's heard about Jesus. And she refers to Jesus as son of David and Lord. And she sees Jesus as the one person who can help her. And so here is someone that we might discount or see as a foreigner that is familiar enough with what we believe and is drawn to what we believe and we need to welcome them and help them. So to me it just, I think it's tremendously significant that Matthew writing to a Jewish audience was showing to the Jewish people the, the way in which this woman was already attracted to and knew something about the Jewish faith had come to Jesus because she realized that Jesus was the one person who would be able to help her. So who might I be, tend to just kind of dismiss and exclude that already has been drawn, that God has already drawn to them, that I need to be a part of helping them clo get closer to God? Now, then we have the second story in this series of events. Jesus heals a deaf man. Um, here we see that Jesus was up in Tyre, he was up in Sidon, where he saw the Canaanite woman, and then he comes back. And again, he does not leave Israel very often, but this time he comes back by the Sea of Galilee to the region of the Decapolis. Uh, Decapolis is 10 cities. Those are 10 Greek culture cities. And so this is a Greek culture area. It's like uh, when Jesus cast the demons into the pigs or allowed the demons to go into the pigs. This is probably in the Decapolis because you wouldn't have pigs in Jewish territory, Greek culture area that Jesus goes to. And so they, verse 32, they brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech and they begged Jesus to lay his hands on him. I made the comment how fortunate this man was to have friends like those. Unidentified people, they brought him to Jesus and they begged Jesus to lay his hand on them. How fortunate he was to have friends like those. It's like in Mark 2 when Jesus is probably at Peter's house and it's so crowded that people come with a lame friend and what are they going to do? Well, they go up to the roof and they make a hole in the roof and they let the friend down um, to where Jesus is. How fortunate that man was to have friends like those. When have you needed a friend like the friends of the deaf man? And when have you been like the friends of the deaf man? A deaf man had an impediment in his speech. As I understand it, people who cannot hear have a hard time speaking because they can't hear. I remember years ago, our school principal adopted a little boy and he, he just did not hear, he, excuse me, he did not speak clearly at all. And, and they finally figured out it's well because uh, there was something wrong with his hearing. And so they treated his hearing. And once he was treated by his hearing, for his hearing, then he was able to speak clearly. Otherwise, he was speaking like he was hearing. Then after that, I remember, I mean, he was this, this cute little guy. And in the preschool Christmas program. The program ended with his singing, Jesus Loves Me. And there was not a dry eye in the house. It was just incredible. But he can do that after he could speak clearly and he could speak clearly after he could hear. And so there's an interesting connection. Then he took him aside in private, away from the crowd. Jesus shows sensitivity to the man, dealing with him away from the crowd and privately. When have you just been glad that, you know, Jesus dealt with you away from the crowd and privately. He put his fingers into his ears and he spat and touched his tongue, the power of human touch. And then looking up into heaven, he sighed and he said, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And Ephatha is Hebrew for be opened. And it's significant that Mark gives us the translation because Mark knows that the people to whom he is writing don't speak Hebrew, and so they're not going to know what Ephatha is. I understand that there's a Lutheran ministry to the deaf that is called Ephatha Ministries, and that's where that comes from. But he looks up into heaven and he sighs. How good it is to know that when Jesus sees our need, he sighs. 
When has there been a time in your life where you just need to know that when you came to Jesus with your need, he would sigh? That reminds me of Elliot and E.T. Do you remember uh, that movie? And so uh, I think um, if, I, if I remember saying that somebody hurt their finger and said, ouch, and then they were going to become separated. And so if I remember right, E.T. touched his heart and said, ouch. Well, when Jesus sees our pain, he sighs. And when Jesus sees our needs, he says, ouch. Immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. It happened immediately. And then just Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astounded beyond measure. And so I close with a question, what have you seen Jesus do? When have you experienced Jesus doing something for you that has not just made you astounded, but made you astounded beyond measure? And so let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the friends of that man who brought their friend to Jesus and begged him to help the man. We pray that we thank you for the people in our lives that have been friends like those. And we pray that we will be friends like those to people in need. We thank you for the way in which you deal sensitively with our need. There are times when you just need to deal with us privately, and we thank you for that, that uh, the way that you do it. We thank you that as you look up into heaven and sigh, so when you see our need, you sigh and you touch your heart and say, ouch. We thank you for those times where what you do is so amazing that we are astounded beyond measure. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.